السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Welcome back everyone to Behind the Minbar uh, where we try our best to set blueprints for better masajid, better Islamic centers Alhamdulillah we are uh, very honored and humbled that someone as busy as the Dr. Tahir Wyatt has given us uh, his evening Jazak Allah Dr. Tahir Alhamdulillah, Dr. Tahir Wyatt is a PhD in comparative religion. Yes. Did I get that right? Alhamdulillah. I'm I'm rushing to all the other parts of the uh, of the biography in my head. Mashallah. Uh, you're you're involved in many niches. One of our our senior research directors at Yaqeen Institute. Alhamdulillah, and uh, at the UMM in Philadelphia, and co-founder here at Eden's Garden. Uh, a a mega promising project, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah bring it to fruition. Amin, amin, ya Rab. So, Sheikhna, I, let me uh, begin by uh, reading the bio about Behind the Mimbar. <laughs> well, I, I don't have one, actually. <laughs> but to be honest, Sheikh, we just wanted these, as we keep saying, to, to represent a bit of a conversation starter, uh, a commitment or a spark uh, for commitment towards Ihsan. And uh, we we are fully cognizant that these sort of uh, discussions are not necessarily for mass consumption even. Like going into it, we knew these weren't necessarily, you know, these mass inspiration type pieces. But they were very much so for niche audiences, people trying to get to work or at work, trying to like move past spinning their wheels in the mud or whatever else it may be. Uh, and alhamdulillah, you know, Allah Azza wa Jal has shown us bits of that. Yes, it has not... Uh, gained mainstream traction per se in terms of the views of these videos and we expected that and what we were hoping for we weren't sure to expect it or not will it actually reach the right audiences mm. and you know uh, we, we just fielded a, an email recently about you know a sister all the way in uh, uh, in Hawaii that you know has renewed her her resolution her determination to get involved in her masjid her masjid Sunday school and you know level up and, and that's what this is about right and, you know, I always say that uh, it takes a village to raise a child, Allah. right? And so I often refer to my masjid in hopes that it will become, almost as an intention, mm. uh, that it is the Islamic village. Allah. That's what's intended by it, right? The Muslim life center. And recently, the inspiration for this episode was why I said, I need to sit down with you and uh, benefit from your nasiha is that at the recent NJ Dawah conference, you said that it takes a masjid to make a hero. But that dovetailed really well. Like, you, <laughs> like oh man, I got to get this man on the podcast. Uh, alhamdulillah. So I do want to speak about the educational element in particular, how masjids manufacture heroes through education more than anything else. But why do we even need heroes to begin with, right? Uh, regardless of how we're going to produce that hero. Because other episodes, to be honest, have covered some of the socio-emotional elements, the atmosphere of the masjid, the vibe, the welcoming nature, the professionalism. But we haven't touched education yet as part of one of the core components of making these Muslim heroes mm. of the next generation. But why do we need heroes to begin with? So, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ma wa la ma ba'd. So, first of all, I want to thank you and, yani, first of all, for, for hosting me. But even more importantly, this series is amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it is extremely impactful to target masjid boards um or let's just call it the leadership of the masjid whether it's the board or not because volunteers. obviously exactly For sure uh committees and so on and so forth to to have some kind of blueprint uh as you talked about mm -hmm. for those folks so it doesn't really matter subhanallah yani, maybe um maybe the person that listens to it is going out and affecting thousands of families and you, you only see one view right one one like but the impact is greater than that. And that's that's better for a person with a lie. So anyway, yes. right? As Imam Shafi Rahimullah Ta'ala said, I, mean, I would hope that this knowledge was spread. Right? And that nothing of it would be attributed to me. Right. The point is for the knowledge to get out there. Sure. And so this to me, mashallah, is a is a beautiful, beautiful effort. It is much needed. I am hoping that there are copycat efforts as well. Me too. That people go out and just think about how can we make our massage more impactful for the community as a whole. I genuinely have seen massage change neighborhoods, not just the Muslims, but I, and I don't have any data on this, but anecdotally, and, and I can tell you, you know, in, in Philadelphia for sure, 
everywhere where you put a masjid, the real estate goes up hmm. because the if they if it's if it's something if there's anything going on negativity, clubs, uh, uh, drugs being sold or whatever it else, whatever else it might be. And the same thing in New York happened as well in different places. And you think about masjid Tukwa and what it's happened around there. When, when the masjid comes in, the negativity pushes out slowly but surely, or sometimes fastly, <laughs> depending on. <laughs> who's in the match <laughs> right <laughs> um, but so so what happens is they call it physical therapy yeah, yeah there you go physical therapy that's <laughs> it that's it depending on how many physical therapists you have in the match right so it helps to clean up the neighborhoods which changes the dynamic uh of, of the community as a whole so i mean massage uh can be even more impactful be even like tired and i think that the issue is like you said striving for sin it's it's not just about being good it's about how can we continue to improve and, and be better so on the point of heroes and, and and why we need heroes the the reality is is that everybody looks for somebody to follow mm. that that's just the nature of Benny adam and Allah told our prophets of the was them to follow the middle of ibrahim like even our prophet sallam in that respect was not uh and he, I'm not some innovator amongst the messengers. I'm not coming with something new in that sense. I'm following that long line of, of messengers. So everybody is going to look to somebody yeah. to follow. Everybody needs heroes in that sense, or we can use the broader term role models, yeah. right? Um, and our prophet, Isaiah Salatu Salam, without a doubt, was the best role, role model for the You have in the Messenger of Allah the, the best of examples. And so we're all looking for someone to follow. That is just the nature of who we are. We recite in Surah Al-Fatiha, which I find to be uh, very uh, interesting and amazing because when we say guide us to the straight path, that's, that's a dua by itself. Like yeah. the, Technically, you don't need to add anything to it. It could have stopped there. Yeah. But the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal is commanding us to say, Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim, the, the path of those whom you have favored, means that we should be actually cognizant of the fact that people have walked this path already. Who are those people? We should be the ones. Uh, seeking them out and following them. They are our heroes. Uh, you think about the dua of uh, Al Hassan that you hear all the time in, in Witr. Allah Mahdina bas la. Allah Mahdina fiman hadait. Guide us amongst those whom you have have guided. So it, we're even being even on our dua, like hmm. we're being instructed to look for those people who we should be following, those people who should be our heroes, and so. Long story short, uh, if if we are not um, consciously teaching our children and even ourselves, honestly, if we're not teaching who our heroes should be, and we're going to take other people as heroes, we're going to take them as icons, idols, huh? American idols, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Right. We're going to take somebody and we're going to try to be like them. We're going to try to follow their path. SubhanAllah, Sheikh. You know, I, uh, I'm listening to uh, two things came to mind. First of all is like the minimum of Al-Fatiha being 17 times a day, right? Across the five prayers. That means my mind should be visiting the notion of who's my role model Allah. 17 times a day. Allah. You contrast that with how many messages there are out there of sort of unworthy role models. Like there is the shoe. There is the billboard. Yes. There is sort of the news feed. There... So you need at least 17 sort of antidotes to that sort of uh, that poison, right? Exactly. That, uh, that venom. Uh, the other thing that came to mind is, is not just that we need the role models. The world needs role models, and we can't be that for them unless we're an extension of the prior ones, right? No. Nah. When Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, uh, it just comes to mind right now, the, uh, uh, the narration when he read... Uh, وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا I, 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 Wallahi, I was just about to say the same thing. <laughs> I must have learned it from you then, Sheikh. Uh, very likely so. Uh, oh, make us that. imams. Mm. Uh, imams could be modeling, not necessarily just authority in the, in the power sense, right? right? You command authority. You don't necessarily have to demand or wield uh, political authority or sort of communal authority. Uh, make us imams for the pious. Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he said, نَقْتَدِي بِمَنْ قَبْلَنَا 
ويقتدي بنا من بعدنا that we follow in the footsteps of those before us so that we may be followed our footsteps those after us by those after us if, and if so I'm the not, world needs role models if yeah. i'm not mistaken i think at-tabari also narrates something very similar on mujahid rahimahullah a, a very similar uh tafsir for for that particular dua Mashallah. again yeah, yeah. in other words make us good followers of the good people who came before us so that we can be good leaders good enough to be followed yeah good, good leaders for those after us that, yes so why does the world need heroes? Why does the world need leaders? Leading them where? Where has the world drifted to uh, at this moment? Because sometimes we overlook it. We think, you know, like that Islam is is fine. We're not going to say inferiority complex, but about Islam being exceptional, Islam being the need of the hour. I think a lot of people, uh, they sell themselves short or sell their Islam short of what we have to offer. So I, I could not agree with you more. Um, it is a common message that I try to uh, uh, inspire other people with because I, I feel like I have also benefited from from this message, which is that on a communal level, um, I, I feel like I feel like the dialogue shifted a lot after nine eleven. Hmm. Um, I, I feel like. And again, this is purely my own experience. Uh, I don't. I don't have any data to back this up. But I will say that if you, even if you go back and you you can find old footage of things uh, from the '90s, for example, and most likely before then, and I've interviewed uh, over a hundred Muslims from the the '70s. I'm talking about from the early '70s, who were Sunni Muslims um, from the late '60s. Some of them from the late '50s. Hmm. Um, and just what was their attitude towards uh, Islam? How did they feel as Muslims right. during that time? So what I will say was there was a lot of izzah, um, feeling really proud to be Muslims. And there's a big difference between pride and arrogance, as I'm, sure. I mean, but I don't want to go into that, that whole spiel. So they, they were proud to be Muslim. After 9-11, uh, national organizations um, uh, were pushing a different type of rhetoric. Uh, and, and this happened on a on a local level as well, uh, because we didn't want to be labeled as terrorists. Please accept uh, us rhetoric. Yes, that that became the language, mm. and I'm not saying it was a please accept us, but the the language was more like we want to be accepted, right? That that's that's what we're looking for. We want to be accepted by society. Even the interfaith work was a lot of, you know, just um, how can we? Uh, we just want the same rights as everybody else. Mm. You lose exceptionalism, right? When you just want to be accepted, um, and and you just want to be equal. Man, subhanallah. Uh, if that's if that's the messaging, it it's dangerous. Yeah. Uh, no, no. So 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 listen what happens, because now instead of you, because there's a there's a my there's a there's a shift in the question, yeah. and, and let me let me tell you what I mean by it. The question. How do we help our kids stay on stay in Islam? Mm. That's a question. It's a valid question, and we hear at the beginning of every khutbah, uh, "Don't die unless you are Muslims." So, how do we keep our kids Muslim? Mm. That's one question, and we're going to develop a program if that's the question that we're answering. Yeah, I'll tell you, if I change the question just a little bit and I say. How do we raise a generation of Muslims with the tools that they need to lead society as a whole? It's a very different it's like, project. It's a different project. Hmm. It's it's a different question. But I personally believe that you you keep the Muslim along the way. Like that's if 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 I'm giving them the tools that they need to be leaders of society as Muslim, then they're gonna be Muslim, inshallah. And they're gonna they're going to be working on the skill sets that they need to be mm. able to lead whatever, wherever they are. Now, they may not be senators or presidents, and even those people are not actually, well, I don't want to get too political, but they a lot of them got strings on them, and they're being pulled by other right. people who are actually leading them. But I'm saying, even if it was just on a communal level, even, you know, I, I know that uh, America has very different demographics, but when I think at it from a, a, a urban context, most blocks have block captains, for example. Imagine a project where 
if there's a Muslim on the block, that Muslim is the black captain, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just a different kind of thing. And and what what type of uh, you know programs that they would institute just for their block mm-hmm. to make sure that you don't have old ladies, 70 years old, 75 years old, out there shoveling the snow, which is what we just went through, which was happening, yeah. right? Where the Muslim organizes it in a different way, where the young people respect the older people and take care of them. And I mean, just along those lines, what I'm saying is, if we think of ourselves in that light, that we actually can lead, because Eliza Wajel has given us revelation. Mm-hmm. That the, the gift of unadulterated revelation is uh, we probably take for granted as Muslims, right. but believe me, as as one who has you know gone through uh, the the religious text of uh, other religions and so on and so forth, it is a nirma, a true blessing from Eliza Wajel to have his speech. Right, that we can rely on, and the best example, the most superior example of any human to ever walk the earth, and that is our prophet Isaiah Salatu Salam. Having that, and then taking what we have, the resources that we have in the Muslim community. Subhanallah. I mean, mm-hmm. we're not uh, we're not a, a community of one demographic, which which is also part of our strength. We we bring together the most diverse first religious community group in America. Of people, it's amazing. That's a fact. That is amazing, mm-hmm. right? So I genuinely believe, right, that we have the tools to begin to move in that direction where we change the question that we're asking, and our kids are going to be the beneficiaries of that. Uh-huh. The Idni Ta'ala, and so will society as a whole. You know, Dr. Sherman Jackson, uh, Philly guy, by the way. Is he Philly? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Except that it's in Philadelphia in 1978. Well, that's got, eight years before I was born. <laughs> so got, I know him as the West Coast guy. <laughs> got got his PhD from Penn. Oh, wow. Mashallah. Yeah, yeah. No, phenomenal, phenomenal visionary. I mean, yeah. Allah bless him and protect him. I mean, for Fayed. I mean. He, uh, I heard him not too long ago mention how we have been captives of the are you a terrorist question. Uh since 9 11. Mm. He said, Look, 9 11 happened. Many people don't remember this. Everyone is pointing a finger at us. We're the boogeyman. Are you a terrorist or not? And so, since that was the question, we mobilized all of our efforts, all of our resources, whatever little they were, and relatively they are little, even if they're a lot, right? Uh, to proving to the world mm. we are acceptable. We are fine. You know, we're not that bad. He said, And think about that. Just like our black people inferior, people went down the path of putting together, you know, academic campaigns and research studies to prove you're still a captive of the question. It's a distraction. The question is a distraction is what he's arguing, right? Mm. Likewise, our Muslim terrorists, you sit there, a captive, feeling forced to respond. Mm. He says, and now fast forward 20 years, so many of the average Americans, you ask them, what are Muslims? They're going to tell you, you know, Muslims are they're decent people. They're not terrorists. They'll never tell you they believe in one God. They believe in a final prophet. They believe in Jesus as well. They believe you got to be good to your parents. They believe an elderly woman should be helped shoveling the snow in the wintertime. Because <laughs> we never were trying to answer that question of what is exceptional? What value does Islam add? Mm. But Sheikh, I have sort of two questions I want right. no, 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 to render this is good. you captive of for the rest of the episode. Bismillah. The, the first of them, Bismillah. The first of them is, do do we sometimes assume that the Muslims, this is the educational side, right? Even know what they have, right? Mm. I So many times, these are, yes, is, isolated cases, but I have a lot of, I mean, I have data as well. And mm. even if I didn't, I can make it up because everything, <laughs> everything on the internet is a fact. <laughs> and no one's going to fact check after me. Because I'm wearing a kufi. Yeah, there you go. There I'm you a go. sheikh. MashaAllah. Right? No, but really, like the average literacy of Islam, mm. uh, like it, it's no secret. I mean, I, I'll never forget, uh, you know, uh, the example of an Islamic school. There was a scholar visiting from the Muslim world. Uh, I've shared this maybe on a previous episode. And they're giving him a tour of one of the Islamic schools in Brooklyn. And they're like, sheikh is one of our sort of best students. And she was like a sweet girl. It wasn't like sort of top academic achiever or anything. Sixth grader from Muslim country. Uh, Muslim majority country and so he just gave her like a simple a freebie question he said to her what's the Prophet Muhammad's last name mm. uh, and she said to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so it's cute 
you'll laugh for a second, but it's also very scary because like if you're in a world that is antagonistic to religion and it's all you know. And then actually when I uh when I went to another city once, they asked me to sit with the high school girls. And I don't know why these are both girl examples. I have tons of guy examples as well. Don't judge me. <laughs> uh, I was giving them a talk. They asked me to give the high school girls a talk about manners. So I'm just, you know, whatever's coming to mind of sort of anecdotes from our setup, from our righteous predecessors. And I, I wind up uh, getting to a story about, you know, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an. But I'm seeing that, like, most of the girls in front of me are, like, totally checked out. They're not interested. I'm trying to figure out what it is, trying to find, you know, an inroad with them to, to stimulate them. And then all of a sudden, I just a thought came to my head. I said, hey, you, who's Abu Bakr? She looked at me and she said, the prophet? Mm. And like, I almost passed out because this is the daughter of a founder of a masjid. Right. So, right. And you're talking about an Islamic school? In a masjid, Sunday oh, school. Okay. okay. Got it. Right. And I can spend the next half hour and so can you sharing yeah, yeah. similar stories. And so sometimes there's assumption that we know mm. the, the, the very basics even of what is Islam, let alone what is a distinction of Islam? What makes it exceptional? Okay, so this is a, a profound, um, uh, profound examples that you have given that point to another uh, issue. I think that exists in our community. So let let, let, let me let me. I'm, I'm looking at this from two angles. Mm. Number one is, I, I think that we often do not value what we have as Muslims. Um, many of us just take it for granted, for mm -hmm. example. Um, we don't realize the value of the Quran. We don't realize the value that comes in the example of the life of the Prophet And we've already adopted another worldview, whether we realize it or not. We've just kind of absorbed um, the uh, the environment in which we live. I mean, it's, it's natural. Like, it, people are products of their environments. So if a person, I mean, you look at the, these children who are spending, you know, uh, oftentimes the majority of their waking hours outside of their homes, right? And they're getting all of these um, uh, signals and messages coming from, as you mentioned, the, the clothes, the billboards, the w whatever. The curriculum. The, the, the curriculum in the schools. Th this is a worldview. Worldviews start with ontology, right? What? exists what does and does not exist uh and so when your worldview or the dominant worldview either there is no god or it really doesn't matter irrelevant if there's a god right then what are we actually left with because yeah. everything comes after that and even when we start talking about uh, morals and ethics, or we talk about law and politics, that's pretty low on the totem pole of a worldview. That's all based on, do we have a purpose? My ultimate reference uh, point, yeah. Uh, yeah Foundations. I, how, your epistemology. Mm -hmm. How do you know what you know? How, what are your sources of that knowledge? How do you acquire it, right? So, Sheikh, you know, please don't lose your train of thought, but, uh, you know, it, it, one uh, sort of uh, Muslim scholar said something that needs to be captured here that, epistemology, ontology. You don't have to even know these terms to be inundated sort of with these lenses. They're basically lenses. How do I look at the world, right? 100%. You may not know that you're a radical skeptic that you know, that stems from sort of a Cartesian doubt, which is attributed to Rene Descartes, which, uh, which no, is a most... reaction to distrust from the church and some trauma from being lied to. You just inhaled it. Correct. And that's how you see the world. Correct. People need to realize that. It's not, it's not just when you get to philosophy 101 and get all the jargon. No, it, no, no. It gets shake, in you early. Shake. No, no, no. Here, 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 I'm going to tell you like this. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's really this simple. Your worldview is like language. You just have it, mm. right? It's it's whatever environment you're in. So Soak, soak it up. Yeah, you you soak up that worldview. It, yeah. Same way you soak up. Like right now, I mean, you could go to the, I'm probably a large majority of Americans and, and say a sentence to them and say, identify the, the noun, the adjective, the verb and the adverb and the this and the that. And if you get it a little deeper, yeah. the syntactic structure and all of that, and they'll be looking at you like you're Medjinun, right? But they speak perfect but English. But they speak perfect English. And they, yeah. and they can pick up a book and read it just as well, right. right? But they don't know all of that stuff. So same thing, like you just said. you We may not know all of these terms, but your worldview, you just get it. And, I, and what I'm saying is that 
if we are not actively in, you know, pushing a different worldview, right, that is centered around Allah Azza wa Jal, that that theology and everything that yeah. that, that comes that stems from it, we're going to be fighting an uphill battle down the down the yeah, road. Yeah. Right. And so I, I feel like so that's one side of it. So the one side is just us not valuing enough uh, what we have in Islam. And then, subhanAllah, you know, going through all of these uh, hoops and everything like that, only to face some type of uh, calamity in life or wake up call or whatever it might be. And then a person starts backtracking and trying to find out where their life went wrong and where it fell into pieces. And I'm saying this, this is even Muslims, but just without the without the proper education, right? So then the, the, the other side is what I think is happening in a lot of, you, you mentioned like the, the Sunday school example. Uh, and so we'll get back to the education now in, in the, the masajid is that Alhamdulillah is a good thing that there's been this um, sahwa, if you will, of, you know, you can go into many different masajid across uh, the United States of America and you'll find halaqat al tahfid and mashallah people memorizing the Quran and not just uh, not just with the uh, one qira'a but different qira'at and riwayat and mashallah Allah mubarak like really uh, you know even teaching them how to beautify their voices and uh, right. it's it's amazing Allah mubarak and um, the the number of Quran competitions that we have both uh, regional and national on Mashallah, inspiring these kids to to put effort into the memorization of the Quran, and and I think that that is a great thing. I think that now we have to step it up uh, and and start, uh, you know, uh, instituting other types of um, uh, structured learning for our youth. Like, so this is where the structure is right now. We have a lot of structure around memorizing the Quran. Right. But I, I think that, uh, and this kind of goes back to the initial question that you asked me about heroes. I think that there has to be uh, a structure yeah. that is in place that that now all of these kids who we have, mashallah, and, and we have their attention for a certain period of time uh, every day or every week or whatever the program may be, that we start teaching them about who their real heroes are, right. who they should be trying to emulate. Um, and also, also, and I think that this is critical as well, is that that there be some type of structure around learning the meanings of the Quran, right? So a lot of us get really excited about tahfid, and mm. we go and we quote, Uthman radiallahu ta'ala and who said that the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said, huh? khayrukum, khayrukum, ha, shabab, the best of you, the best of you, man ta'allam al-Quran wa allama, those who learn the Quran and who teach it. I am not aware of any of the scholars of hadith who have explained that hadith that stopped at memorizing the Quran. Right. Ta'allam al-Quran and learning the Quran is not just learning the, the huruf, the letters, uh, learning the tajweed of the Quran and memorizing it. It's also learning the meaning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So, ten, ten at a time. So, Right. So Taban right. Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who was and, and others from amongst the Sahaba who would learn ten at a time, as you said. But I, I look at it even on a on another level, right? The mission of the Prophet والسلام, was not just to recite the ayat, right? Who will the bait of Ummiyina Rasul and Minhum Yatlu Alayhim Ayatihi Wa Yuzakihim Wa Yu Alimuhum al Kitab al Hikma. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ was sent by Allah Azza wa Jal to do what? To recite to them the ayat. That's that's the uh, tajweed, the huruf, the memorization. huh? And to purify them and to teach them the book. So the Prophet ﷺ did not stop at just reciting the Quran to them. He taught them the Quran and what the Quran means. And I really feel like uh, for our institutions to step up to the next level and to start that process of giving the youth the tools that they need, right? To, to be leaders in their society. They've got to value also the meanings of the Quran. Sheikh, what do you uh, think of my theory? Let's go. That not just is this absolutely essential, uh, but rather this should be prioritized 
over memorization. You know, because you have like the riwayat that ta'alamna al-imana thumma ta'alamna al-Qur'an, right? We, we learned faith first. Uh, and then we learned the Qur'an and it increased us in our faith. And people after us at the end of time will learn the Qur'an first before they learn faith. And sort of like they will go astray. The, the, you know, I, I know it's very tricky territory because this can always be misunderstood, misconstrued as downplaying memorization of the Qur'an. I remember actually just to keep it a little bit light, uh, Dr. Saeed al-Kamali, mm. uh, Hafidhahullah, um, great Moroccan scholar, uh, contemporary scholar, he heard a young man <laughs> comment about this brother memorizing the Quran, and he said, uh, you know, another book on the shelf. Or he said something along the lines of, well, Banu Israel were described in the Quran as, uh, like a donkey carrying a library, meaning you didn't benefit. You don't even know what you're carrying. And so the sheikh got tight. The sheikh said, how dare you speak about a bearer of Allah's book like that? Allah didn't even deem you worthy to be a donkey carrying a library. <laughs> how, did, how does that feel? <laughs> so I get it. That's not what we're saying. No, no, no. But not at all. It, it, a little bit of pragmatism or even subhanAllah, how the early Muslims did it, push come to shove. You know, even Sheikh Saeed himself, Dr. Saeed al kamali uh, you know, he says that in the halaqat we have in the Bedou of, of Morocco, where they have the time, they have sort of the atmosphere, the competitive, it's culture, it's second nature to them, like it is in, in Mauritania, for example. Certain parts of Morocco are like this. They go from halaqa to halaqa. So like there's a, you get 10 ayat, mm. memorize it right, then you go get the qiraat, mm. then you go get sort of the performatory, you know, skill, the, ah. you know, yeah. and then you, you go get the ahkam, mm. and you go get the ikhtilaf. And so you're doing all, the nasikh and every one of them is a halaqa, and you circle. It's, but like, let's be real. You know, at the end of the day, you know, uh, how do we purify ourselves on the most fundamental level, right? It's oh, It always came out, my theory, not my theory, but what I called uh, prematurely my theory, yuzakihim wa yu'allimuhum. It was always purified them before mm. taught them. Because if you learn it without sort of being purified by its recitation first, it will not benefit you mm. or it will sort of like harm you. It will adversely affect you. You got people who have Quran that get nothing from it. I know people who left Islam. I know people in prisons that are huffaf, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or people that sort of have the Quran as just ammo for their arguments. It's mm -hmm. just sort of like ego artillery mm -hmm. for them. At, at the end of the day, if push come to shove, how do you keep Muslims Muslim, right? So the prioritizing of comprehension of the worldview, like how much, how many hours and dollars do we have in our community for these kids? So, Sheikh, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm with you on prioritization. I, I don't necessarily think that we can't combine between the two. Mm. I, I think that a lot of this is taking the easy way out, right? It's it's not difficult to find someone who has memorized the Quran well, mm -hmm. right? And who has a very good method, for example, of yeah. helping others memorize the Quran. Mm. The issue of actually finding the type of Mashaikh, uh, students of knowledge or otherwise, who can uh, extract from the Quran the or, or or even communicate to a younger audience these meanings of the Quran. Not we're not just because we're not just talking about hey let's sit down and read it in English, right? We're, we're actually talking about explaining to them a bit of the Quran. I will tell you something on a personal note. Um, that has been very helpful uh, Please, yeah. for my children. Um, as they would memorize the Quran, we would also have them read the Quran to the the some some translation that we would pick, mm. um, and they would read it in English after they memorized, and sometimes while they were memorizing. Because for some for some of my children, it was difficult for them to memorize without having some kind of cursory understanding. Now, mind you. Uh, most of my children grew up most of their lives in Saudi. Mm. Um, and uh, a couple of them had a decent grasp of what they were memorizing in the first place. Right. right? Okay. Uh, so this is going to vary from child to child. Uh, I still have a child that's memorizing the Quran. And well, alhamdulillah, uh, even his, uh, you know, his mother reinforces that, hey, 
make sure you're reading this in English as well, because then we might ask questions. What's that mean? Sometimes they get tripped up on an eye, and sometimes like you get tripped up on an eye, and it totally like <laughs> obliterates the meaning, right? You're like, whoa, right. whoa, what do you right, mean? And the Sali Hina Fiji Hana, whoa, whoa, right. <laughs> like, uh, what do you mean? So, uh, so th- th- there's there's that, but again, this is giving you uh, uh, just a, a very broad overview, right? Um, and, and then there's, but there's so many other gems, right, that that can be pulled. Subhanallah, and I, I think that that's important to. Uh, instilling the children from a very young age this is a book that holds so much wisdom so so many gems can be can be extracted from it so again my my whole point is it's it's not easy to find those kind of people right that will actually but again this is where we have to start thinking out loud to say hey wait a minute can we do a juzama for children um sheikh it's yeah. not very easy and mm-hmm. i'm not disagreeing it's not very easy to find a full time health teacher okay right like Fair. it's a very difficult job i have such deep admiration for health teachers right mm-hmm. like year in year out i don't want i don't know if the word sort of tedious is, is inappropriate but it's like rote you know typical uh, just cyclic uh, takes so much stamina mm-hmm. so much self motivation right and so uh, the, i i believe it's harder to find sort of a reliable you know uh, tier 1 health teacher uh, than it is to f- find even a khatib or an imam, right? And so what I'm talking about is finding not even khatibs, people that know Quranic themes. Mm, mm. Like, what do you mean you went to Sunday school for eight years and you don't know the meaning of Qul ahad, mm. right? Like, yeah. what do you mean you don't know the meaning of al-Fatiha, right? That That's what scares me. You know, at, at the end of the day, I, I feel like, and, and, and subhanAllah, point well taken, Sheikh. I think also, we're giving ourselves a false dichotomy. It's like all or none. Like we only have two hours. So like, what are we going to do with them? I think that's a part of the problem with the way I'm thinking. Or I've sort of accepted that the parents are only going to give me their kids for two hours on a Monday and a Wednesday. And that's it. Right. In yeah. the evening time. Cause they have piano yeah. <laughs> and they have everything else. Right. <laughs> but, but you gave a beautiful example of at the end of the day, you're not just expecting this of the masjid. When we get home, we're reading something together as well. Yeah. So, but in light of what the masjid can do, Quranic themes, Quranic worldview, Quranic ethics, you only have time for so much. But right? again, Sheikh Muhammad, so I, I still think that this is a, a duty of those who have recognized that this uh, that there's this gap, right? Yes. There's the, there's a gap in the literature. There's a gap in us even talking about it, right? Beautiful. So so let me give you, uh, let me let me actually tie this back into the the heroes theme. Yeah. Um, it, which which is extremely interesting. The the author of Malik uh, bin Anas, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, Imam Dar al-Hijra, Imam of the Madhab, right? He said, كَانَ السَّلَفُ يُعَلِّمُونَ أَوْلَادَهُمْ حُبَّ أَبِي بَكِرٍ وَعُمَرُ كَمَا يُعَلِّمُونَهُمْ السُّورَةَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Right? That they, that the Salaf, our righteous predecessors, and this is him saying that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Imam Malik died in 179, right? right? He's saying his Salaf, they used to teach their children the love of Abu Bakr and Umar. In other words, they're teaching them their seerah, their bios, their virtues, their merits, what they did, their accomplishments. They used to teach their children that the way that they would teach them a surah from the Quran. So what we get from here is that anything that there was emphasis on teaching they would say, like you would teach them a sorter from the Quran. Yeah. Right? So uh as it comes, for example, in uh in the Tashahud of Ibn Abbas, uh ta'ala anhumah, he said that the Prophet taught us this tashahud, the way that he would teach us a sorter from the Quran. The Ibn Mas'ud is the hand in the hand. Mm-hmm. So uh and, and, and other things like the uh, uh Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he talks about uh al istikhara. Mm-hmm. The Prophet ﷺ would teach us istikhara the way that he would teach us a sword from the Quran. That was the, the that, standard. That was the standard, mm-hmm. which means that teaching a sword from the Quran had a very high station with the Prophet والسلام, with the Sahaba, and it followed down by tradition, right? SubhanAllah. So the Quran, but what does it mean to teach them a sword from the Quran? It doesn't just mean he's teaching them the recitation at all. Yeah. It, it, it also means that. The, the same way that he's teaching them to shahud, he's teaching them this. They're not just learning words. They, they're learning the meanings of those words and how to implement them. So, again, back to the statement of uh, Madik, Rahimahullah. He's saying that they would teach them 
to, to love Abu Bakr and to love Umar radiallahu ta'ala and Umar, the way that they would teach them a surah from the Quran. So my thinking when I... Uh, so when you're I, structuring a Sunday school, Sheikh, right? I, you mentioned memorization, yes, comprehension, right. the importance of knowing your heroes, the earliest heroes. Starting with the right? Prophet, right? Prophet how, would you, how much time would you allot to these for a typical student, you'll you'll have outliers that are going to be her fault. They were never the majority in our ummah, right? And you have people that will not give you the time of day. I'm going to give you my kid an hour a week, fix them. We're not talking about those, right? Yeah. Let's talk about the masjid doing his due diligence. You're being asked to counsel a Sunday school. Give me the best fighting chance to keep my Muslims Muslim. Subhanallah. So. I would actually, uh, off the top of my head, and this is a Spin really up. difficult question, Sheikh, but I would probably split it into four. Okay. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. No, it is very practical. That's what we want. Yeah, inshallah. yeah. So I, a, a fourth would be for uh, memorizing the Quran. Okay? A fourth would be dedicated to comprehension, especially, and it depends on how, you know, where these kids are at in terms of their memorization. But we would be working through some Quranic themes together. But where, no matter where you are in terms of your memorization, uh, because that's just impractical to try to line it up with everybody's memorization because they memorize different things different times. Uh, I would set a, a, a fourth aside for Sira and Tariq of some sort, right? right? So I'm saying specifically the life of the Prophet Ali and the biographies of the righteous. And the biographies of the righteous. It, they need that. Yeah. Wallahi, wallahi, Shaykh. Let me tell you something. SubhanAllah. Um, Allah Azza wa Jal yaqus alayna al-qasas fil Qur'an, right? I mean, he's telling us stories in the Qur'an. And mashallah, you have a beautiful article on this, by the way. Uh, shameless plug. <laughs> but, you know, this is this is a, a significant portion of the Qur'an dedicated to stories, which to me means a lot because Allah Azza wa Jal is our creator. He knows our psychology. He created our psychology. And he knows that we need those stories. Oh, okay. We benefit. We extract uh, lessons from stories, and they stick in our mind, and we and we remember them uh, more than somebody just telling you this is the hukum of this, this is the ruling of that, or whatever. And those things come and go. Stories stay. Subhanallah. Yep. Uh, sidebar. Uh, good friend of mine, uh, Melas Fantala, bless him. Um, hmm. he, uh, he was a juvenile lifer. Hmm. Okay. Um, he murdered somebody at the age of 16 and they sent him to prison for life. So you're never getting out of here. SubhanAllah. Uh, the Supreme court ruled that unconstitutional to sentence juveniles to life. SubhanAllah. Six years ago, Allah uh, blessed that sentence to be overturned. And he came out. He came out of prison a totally different, reformed human being. Subhanallah. Nah, 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 nah. I mean, just amazing person. Allah Mubarak. And now he wants to help uh, other people who are transitioning back into society, but also develop programs to address youth from falling into what he fell into. And what's he what's he call his program? And he's just developing it now. We just met the other day. He was trying to get some help for That's some awesome. things. Yeah. He calls it Joseph's house. I said, "Is this because Yusuf Ali Salam was in prison?" He said, "Exactly, That's right." Normal. But that story, the story of Yusuf, is like ingrained in like even the kids' minds once they learn it. Right? It'll fight your demons for you. Allahu Akbar. That's what, you know, uh, Junaid ibn Muhammad, uh, rahimahullah, Allah. Uh, he said from the, the early generation, he said, jundu min yeah. These stories are one of the armies of God. Nah. They fight your demons for you. Allah Akbar. You want to be like, wait, I am the hero. You want to walk in somebody else's shoes. That's, that's, that's my point. Yeah, this is my yeah. point. No, Allah, it was life trend. Sheikh Hatim, actually, Dr. Hatim al-Hajj, I give yeah. you a, a little bit of a nugget that he's going to kill me for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Whoever knows Sheikh Hatim, uh, don't show him this clip. Um, but he has a very unique attachment to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahab. Uh, and he shared with us once that a big part of this was his obsession with the biographies of the Sahaba. Mm. He said, I'd be in, I think he said sixth and seventh and eighth grade, I'd be in my room. My mom walks in, she sees the math textbook open. Inside, Inside the, the math, math textbook, textbook, I have... Uh, 
رجال حول الرسول yeah. خالد محمد خالد yeah. uh, Men around the messenger mm-hmm. which needs a retranslation mm-hmm. I mean Allah bless the translator putting in English but it, it, it was translated maybe 30, 40 maybe more than that and it just needs a little bit of a revamp because it just it'll never be the Arabic the Arabic just has just this magic a to different it different though yeah a different just, taste the taste yeah. is just different but it can be done justice too uh, because he's a literary and he, he just he, there there's a um, a charisma and a spirit to the writing that insists that you let go of your life for a second and live in their shoes. Uh, and he builds up for it very well and to the end of it. But literally, he has it inside his sex book. <laughs> Looks like he's studying math or whatever else. He's going through the lives of Sahab over and over. And then finally, I did it, Sheikh. Finally, I said, you know what? I'm going to figure this book out. Like I thought I know the lives of the Sahab. And I took it with me on a Umrah trip. And I just, I hibernated with that book. It's transformative. And, it, and it's not just, you know, like oh, amazing sacrifice and it was. Deep conviction and it was. Like, you know, a burning passion for Allah's pleasure and it was. But also to see the transformation in real time. Like you're talking about studying the Quran and studying lives of the Sahab, but then you realize, wait a minute. These aren't different things. This is the product of the Quran. That's what the Quran did. The That's Quran. what the Quran did for right. them. In the right Shepherds of sheep, leaders of nations. Mm. One gen. Quran, right? Mm. You, you, you. It connects all the dots for you, and so you see it. It's not like all oh, the Quran theoretically says that it transforms people. It transforms. Ibn al Jawzi, rahimahullah, he says, "Aslu usul al ilm wa anfa'u al ulum and nazar fi sir al salaf, fi sir al salihin." Oh, come and call. And and then he said, and that is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Ulaika ladina had Allah. Translate that for our listeners, Sheikh, if you don't mind. That is the, and that. In, in the oh, Josie's. Oh, uh, I forgot it. In, <laughs> go for it. He, I do says that that, he says that the the foundation of all knowledge and the most beneficial of all knowledge is to to, to learn the lives, the, the biographies of the righteous. Yani specifically, he mentions the life of the Prophet والسلام, and his Sahaba. And then he says, and this is the meaning of Allah's statement. These, those are the ones, Allah, those are the ones whom Allah has guided. So follow their guidance. Yes, subhanAllah. Follow their guidance. It's like the activate button on, your, on your faith. Like you Allah have it, it's there. No, because Shaykh, we need to we need to see it. We need to see it in action. Yeah. Right? We need to see how does that play out? What, what do, exactly. What does that actually mean? Uh quick story, and then I'll get back to, to my the last fourth. fourth. I didn't yeah. forget how they love. Got you, Shaykh. I, usually, usually, subhanAllah, if I go on a tangent, I don't even know what I was talking about before, but I got, you, back, I got this one. You got this one. So so one day I was at uh Sheikh Abdul Barry's house, Ibn Hamad al Ansari, and Allah Akbar, man, he had just like, you know. Sheikh Hamad's library was like famous in Medina for mm-hmm. being this huge library. Anyway, so I remember at one point we were, uh, you know, we got around the corner to the to the bio section, and you know, I'm looking at Sirah Adam and Nubala by Zahabi, which is a you know voluminous work, 24 volumes, if I'm not mistaken, beginning with the life of the Prophet Ali Salatu Sam and finishing with the lives of some of the great scholars up until you know his uh, his lifetime. And um, something came up, and uh, Sheikh Abdul Barry said, uh, "Yeah, I, I actually didn't notice that till the second time I read the book." And I was like, "Sheikh, um... <laughs> <laughs> you read that? You actually read the book? Uh, so flexing only?" <laughs> no, no. So I was like, uh, "So Sheikh, uh, when you say like the book, I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, no, you got it, you got to read it. I never knew that. Like it was like." For him, it was just like, what do you mean? Uh, how, how do you like? What do you, how do you consider yourself a taller man? Like, how do you consider yourself like a taller man? You didn't really say it. I live in Nublar. Like, you got to know who these people are, right? So, the the point is, I, I would definitely, we, I think we have to. Like, I think this has to be a part of our curriculum. Anywhere, mm-hmm. whatever we're doing, we have to teach them to love these people. We have to tell the stories over and over. It's got to stick for them, right? So, so there's that. The the last fourth. I would dedicate to practical Islam, like hmm. learning how to pray properly, learning how to make wudu properly. You can't assume, subhanAllah, uh, <laughs> trust me, um, that they're just learning this, um, like that their parents are teaching them, actually. A lot of them, they watch their parents, but who said their parents are doing it right? I mean, with all due respect, I'm not, I'm not trying to be, but the thing is, a lot of this stuff is just passed down. Sometimes the parents themselves were not really practicing Islam until later. I mean, all of that, right? So... Um, I think just the practical aspects of Islam are really important. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan for that. So, 
Quranic memorization, comprehension, uh, learning to love, uh, and be very familiar, intimately familiar with the lives of the early Muslims, beginning, of course, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, yeah. and just how to live Islam, yeah. right? Yep. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Sheikhna, is there uh, anything else we missed on the educational front? You know, when I came to Philadelphia Masjid, and this is important, uh, I love the way you were very intentional with your community, uh, developing a sense of duty. You know, you got to pick up your own. You got to pick yourself up. We got to pick this generation up. You got to think from now how you're going to contribute to the ummah. You know, uh, other communities out there uh, with the, uh, you know, their uh, racist projects and those sort of ethno-fascist uh, agendas were very patient and were very intentional about putting themselves under the premise that they needed this for survival and they were under attack by the entire world, right? Uh, that we need to be in law, we need to be in media, we need to be in banking, sort of, we need to be in technology. So very intentional and sort of like, you give credit where credit is due. Uh, and I think some credit is due there. Mm. Uh, likewise, I think the masjid may not uh, have the resource or the bandwidth to do more than facilitate, but at least to point, right? To recruit uh, sort of Muslims, with a sense of duty, or recruit for them that mindset, should I say, right? How do you Im inculcate in a Muslim that I need to take my education seriously, right? And I need to be intentional about my education. I don't want to be sort of defined by, by careerism, like my career is the by all end all. I'm gonna have a career, I'm gonna be conscientious in it, but I'm also going to be ummatic in my contribution in terms of my career. Uh, if you could share a little bit about that and whatever else we, you think we missed out on in terms of the masjid's educational, uh, investments, right? How do we invest in educational purposes that bring about the greatest ROIs, the return on that investment for our communities? Yeah, SubhanAllah. Uh, I think the first thing is being intentional about being a part of a community. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, some people just treat the masjid as a place to pray. Um, Extracurricular. It, it's it's an obligation. I got to go on Jum'ah. Yeah. Right? Uh, it's, uh, I got this burden on me. I get this monkey off my back, right? Go to Jamaa, Khalas. Um, the the reality is is that um, that type of mentality of one basically uh, kind of navigating all this uh, this whole life alone, or just you know with your spouse and your kids and things like that. It, the, the the survival uh, rate for that approach is, is um, I, I don't think is a, is a high survival rate. I don't, I don't think we're talking about generations of Islam and, and people who have detached themselves uh, from the you community. Drift, you drown, be yeah. sure of it. And, sure. and the Prophet Wasallam did tell us, like in no uncertain terms, that the, uh, that the wolf eats the lone sheep, right? Uh, and, he, and he said this as it relates to Salah, right? So, so be with the Jama'ah. And the person, and the Prophet Ali Salat was saying also told us that the person who uh, goes and mixes with the people and is patient with their heart. Because the reality is, is that when you mix with people, uh, not everything is going to be your way. Yeah. It may not even be harmful. You may interpret it as being harmful because it's not what you particularly you wanted. Snub, or right? yeah, but be patient with that. Right, that that person is better than the person that doesn't mix with the people and is not patient with their harm. Well, he could be hadith and hadith. Yani sometimes you may just need to breathe and back up and that type of thing. But that that the default is that you need to be around. Like this is this environment is is difficult alone for us to navigate it together. Yeah. Right. So uh, when you are uh, taking an approach. Where you've kind of distanced yourself from from the community, uh, it's even more difficult to to navigate. So I, I want to start Are you there. to begin with, correct? Before you even talk about circling back to contribute to the community that exactly, you're from, exactly, exactly. So I now, hear you. so now, once a person has determined that, hey, look, I'm going to be a part of the community. Look at the talents that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given you, Subhanallah. Uh, not all of us are the same. Allah opens up doors for some, does not open them up for others. Find your door. Like, literally, subhanAllah. Uh, hadith, where the Prophet alayhi salat was salam, without going through the whole hadith, but he talked about, so whoever is from Ahlul Salah will be called from the gate of Salah. And 
Jannah and the hereafter. And whoever was from the the whoever was from Ahl Sadaqah will be called from the from the door of Sadaqah. And whoever was from the people of Siam will be called from Bab al Rayyan, from the gate of Al Rayyan. And to the end of it, and then uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and who says, Ya Rasulullah, is there somebody gonna be called from all of those doors? And the Prophet I'm say, Yes, and, and I hope that you are from amongst them. Ibn Abdul Bar Rahimahullah Ta'ala in Tamheed after he narrates this uh, hadith, which is in Sahih Bukhari. But he says that it is very rare, it is very rare that more than one door will be open for a person. It is it is the, the norm for most of Beni Adam that Allah is going to bless you with one thing. So, so value it. So, so value that one thing and, and, and go for it. If you find it like it, you're just this generous person and, and it's easy for you to give sadaqah, then, then, then keep doing it. That's your door. That's your door. Be idni lahi be called from that. If it's easy for you to fast on Mondays and Thursdays and Ayam al Bid and and Arafah and uh, and uh, that's your door. Bismillah, go for it. Right? Subhanallah. Because maybe that person is not really uh, doing extra like a whole lot of extra salawat or whatever it is. Right. So he also narrates a beautiful story here. Mm. Uh the, that happened between uh, I want to say uh Abdul Aziz uh, bin Fulan al Umari. Uh, who was a who was a very well known Zahid at the mm. time? Like, uh, in other words, um, how would you translate Zahid? Because uh, ascetic, uh, minimalist, who, who, austere guy. Yeah, let's austere and minimalist, and you know, just uh, didn't have any concern for the dunya. He was a worshiper. Mm. Okay, well known for that. Uh, and he writes this letter to Imam Malik, uh, rahmatullahi alayhi. Yeah, and he trying to convince him to leave off all of this teaching. You're just sitting there teaching all these people, and it's taking away from your ability to do ritual this, devotion. Yeah, your, your, your ritual devotion. Like, what's going on with you? Like, you need to step away from all of those people, and don't worry about that. Like, you know, dedicate yourself to infirad and salat. Yeah, and infirad meaning yeah. uh, isolation and getting away. So, Imam Malik's you know, his his response, Rahmatullah alayhi, was a beautiful response. And he said, and he wrote back to him, he said that Allah Azza wa Jal has qasam al-a'mal, right? Has has distributed the the a'mal, the, that those acts of worship, the way that he has distributed risk amongst people. And some people are rich through camels and others through through gold, and others are not rich at all. And to the end of it, right? SubhanAllah. And he and he split this up. And so Perhaps a person may find that Salat has been made easy for him and Sadaqah is not. And perhaps a person may find that that Siam has been made easy for him and 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 Salat has not been made, meaning extra, right? And he said, of course, yeah. and as for me, as for me, uh, I, I believe that this door that Allah has Teaching opened others. for me of Neshrulim, spreading knowledge. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't believe that what I'm doing is any less than what you're doing. And I hope that we are both upon goodness with Salat, right? So, we take it back to the masjid. Educating how, our communities on how that. Does that. Find your door. Exactly. Find mm. your door. And the masjid needs to open up its doors for those people who have found different doors. Mm. SubhanAllah. Hey, maybe this guy, mashallah, he's a... Uh, like I, I met this uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ubaidah who runs Itqan Robotics. Mm. Like amazing, amazing. Like I went to visit him. Uh, next time you go, I'll tell you. I'm where. familiar. Okay, mashallah. Like an amazing program, right? And you see these kids, and they're building robots. And when it's time for salat, they stop and pray, and they pray at the competitions, right? But imagine the message is just like, what would we do with a robotics program? No, like if we can facilitate that. Hey, that's your door. You're good at that. Hey, even if it's three, four kids, whatever. Mashallah, let's let's do that. A reason for Muslims being, and let's be the best at what we do, mm. right? Subhanallah. Maybe somebody uh, Allah Azza has blessed them with a a, a great, um, you know, uh, a grasp of uh, finance, for example, and they understand the ins and outs. So look, man, we need to host. Uh, uh, you know, wealth management uh, for for the for the community as a whole. Well, well like, I, I'm going to tell you something else. I mean, obviously, living in a capitalist society, money talks. It's very important that we learn a little bit more about wealth management because I, I don't think that we're necessarily literate in, in, in those manners, and we waste a lot of money. Exactly. Subhanallah, and it's very important. Um, because we can, if we pull our resources together properly, I think our impact and influence is going to be even greater. My whole point is, I think that has to be also part of our educational process, mm. to your point. No, no, JazakAllah khaira. So educating them on the importance of educating yourself in a way that can make you 
a top contributor for the community. There you go. So keeping that keeping that in house. No. Not that we don't want the betterment of society. For sure, you don't mean that. No one should ever misunderstand you as saying that. No. But do we have a compounded duty towards our communities? Uh, the community needs to be educated on the fact that they do. We <laughs> no. have a special duty no. uh, t- towards those who have multiple rights on us: the right of humanity and the right of Islam. So may Allah Azza wa use us for khair. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. Ameen, may Allah use you as a key for many doors. Ameen, uh, ameen. Allah of khair Allah. always and ameen. make you a lock for many doors of evil. Allahumma ameen. ameen. Really appreciate your, sh- your time, Sheikh, and sort of coming through for us on short notice. Allah May Allah Allah make it heavy in your scales and bright in your face with it. Ya Rabbi. Ameen. Barakallah fikum, everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.